Good afternoon. My name is Matt Cohen. I'm a member of the AJC Executive Council, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this AJC Global Forum concurrent session. Um, it's also my pleasure to uh, welcome our live, uh, live, stream, our live web stream uh, to an audience around the US and around the globe. Over the course of last year's election campaign, a new political ideology arose, calling itself the alternative right, or it's be as it's been come to be known, the alt-right. We've heard the term, we've heard the term, we're familiar with the names Breitbart, Steve Bannon, Milo uh, Yiamopoulos, and, but what is the alt-right actually about? The alt-right remains a shadowy force it espouses American nationalism and denounces globalism and seeks to sharply curtail immigration in the United States. These are the forces that uh, Donald Trump rode to the presidency. It is undeniably true that many, of the that many of the practitioners hate Jews, Muslims, Latinos, and African Americans, and frankly, anybody they perceive to be a threat to what they call the European heritage of the United States. But as a movement, is the alt-right racist and anti-Semitic, or even neo-Nazi, as some of its critics allege? Was it responsible for attacks on mosques and black churches and other acts of domestic terrorism? To what extent does, all the, does the alt-right pollute social media with hate? Can one fashion government policy, including foreign policy, out of the alt-right uh, precepts and biases? How much influence does it have, if any, on our current administration? To discuss these questions, we have three journalists who have carefully followed the alt-right phenomenon and have occasionally done battle with it. They are McKay Coppins, staff writer for The Atlantic, uh, Yair Rosenberg, senior writer for Tablet, and uh, Jennifer Rubin, opinion writer for The Washington Post. Our moderator will be Dan Elbaum, AJC Assistant Executive Director and Director of Regional Offices. And without further ado, Dan, I'll hand the floor over to you. Thanks so much. You can go on in. Keep going. Thank you, Matt, and thank you all for joining us today. A uh, couple quick notes before we start. Actually, three quick notes. Uh, number one, AJC is a nonpartisan 501c3 organization that does not endorse any political parties. Uh, number two, AJC is a nonpartisan 501c3 organization that does not endorse any political parties. And number three, and very importantly, AJC is a nonpartisan organization that does not endorse any political parties. Thus, having protected our tax-exempt status, let's begin. Uh, <laughs> Jennifer, uh, we heard a bit of a brief description of the alt-right, but for many of us, it wasn't on the Poli-Sci 150 exam, so it's hard to really understand where this movement is, and if you'll forgive the tired old Jewish expression, how is this movement different than all other right-wing movements that we've seen <laughs> during our time? Well, first of all, thank you to the AJC for inviting us, and for all of you for coming out. Um, I am continually amazed that people have not had enough of the world and still want more. Um, but it's good that you are here. Um, even the term alt-right, I think, is controversial because it is a name that, in some respects, has, used to, has been used to domesticate, to tame, what is essentially a white nationalist movement. And there have been white nationalists in American history, going back to the Klan and uh, in various incarnations ever since. So is this a different ideological group? I think the only difference that I see is that they've gotten much slicker, much more sophisticated, and they have reasonably articulate, intelligent people trying to craft some ideological justification for what is a white nationalist movement. McKay, would you, would you agree? I mean, is it the difference between the alt-right and the neo-Nazis or the white supremacists simply marketing? Yes and no. I think that I, I agree with Jen that alt-right is a, a, a kind of squishy uh, term that can mean a lot of different things. I think early on, the alt-right, a, a, a segment of the alt-right was 
uh, composed of basically social media trolls, right? People who uh, m maybe weren't motivated that much by ideology, but were motivated by a desire to provoke, inflame, uh, tweak liberals, uh, you know, cause debate and make people angry, and then kind of laugh at them on their various corners of the dark web. Um, I, I think that it, the, the, the definition of the term has evolved uh, over the past two years. And now I, I do think that, I mean, it, it, I, if there's a difference between neo-Nazis and the alt-right um, in terms of ideology, it's hard to nail that down. I think that uh, for all intents and purposes, it is a white nationalist, I, I'd add a Christian white nationalist uh, belief system. And most of the people who would identify as alt-right uh, would, they may have a more, you know, uh, ironically, politically correct thing, uh, ways to describe their ideology than, than you know, the Klan. But ultimately, they're, they're not in that much disagreement about what they want this nation to become. So Yair, uh, can you speak a little bit about anti-Semitism with the movement specifically? Obviously, all forms of bigotry are unacceptable, but I was wondering if you could specifically talk a little bit about some of the anti-Semitism. And I know what you've all had, your own experiences with this, members of this movement, and so, some borderline comical, some downright menacing within that. It'd be great if you talked a little bit about that, too. Then anyone else can obviously chime in as well. Yeah, so maybe the reason that the alt-right is a panel here at the American Jewish Committee Global Forum is that... Can we make my mic louder? Is that possible? <laughs> Thank you. I'll move it a little. I don't know if I have that ability so much. Here we go. How's this, everyone? This is a perennial hazard of speaking to large groups of Jews. You know, everyone's like, could you be louder? Someone in the back, always. And we apologize um, for the food in advance. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the alt-right sort of exploded into the Jewish consciousness because they started seeing, is it even on? Take it off. <laughs> <laughs> this is so weird. Okay. Why right. is we'll my figure this mic out, guys. different we, than we the Jews' mic? I'm just asking. The Jews, they always get the worst ones. It, it's the alt-right. Yeah. They, they got this. <laughs> um, Maybe just hold it like that. I'm going to hold yeah. it like this. Um, is this, how's this? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate your patience. Um, so one of the reasons the alt-right is uh, such a concern for the Jewish community is because uh, m during the election campaign, many Jewish journalists um, who were covering the campaign and certainly Jewish commentators who might have been critical of Donald Trump's candidacy um, got attacked by this group of uh, <coughs> social media trolls who call themselves, in some respects, the alt-right and uh, organize themselves around Donald Trump's campaign um, with or without his sanction. Um, and Do you want this? This is probably a better idea. I need to turn it on. Is it on? Yes. So, um, and it goes to McKay's um, point about the alt-right, some of these people being beholden to a particular ideology of, say, white nationalism, of Christian white nationalism, and therefore they have it in for Jews, and some of them just being internet provocateurs who want to make other people angry and uncomfortable and sort of an antisocial nihilistic behavior. Um, and so some of these people will tweet anti-Semitic stuff, right, or Photoshop Jewish journalists into gas chambers or concentration camp photos, right, because they're actually anti-Semites, and they'll complain about Jewish control of the media and other stuff. But some of them are just doing it because they want to make Jewish journalists and liberals who are Jews uncomfortable and recede from public life and the social media space. Um, and I see both of them. Um, and so I, and I think it's important for Jews to recognize that, that not all of these people actually believe some of the anti-Semitic slurs that they'll, you know, hurl with abandon um, on internet spaces. A lot of it becomes sort of a culture thing where mocking the Holocaust or pretending like Jews control the media is a great way to get a rise out of a Jewish journalist. And one of the best ways to counter that is not to play along and not to actually get upset and not to, not to get unsettled and realize these are a bunch of anonymous trolls who won't put their names on it because they know, and I have had conversations with people who troll me on social media, you know, anonymous trolls, and they'll say like, and I'll ask them like, why don't you just do this under your own name if you actually believe these things about the Jews? And they're like, well, if I actually put my name on it, I would get fired from my job, right? And I'd be also ostracized from my social circles. And so as long as like, you know, fascist lemming is, uh, is, is with his unicorn avatar is still that, I would worry less. Um, we're about to have an election in the United Kingdom um, on June 8th. Um, in which there are a lot of supporters of the far-left candidate, Jeremy Corbyn, who do some of this sort of stuff from a far-left perspective, but they do it under their own names. 
and they put it on Facebook. And it's a lot, that to me is much more troubling because when people will put their names to stuff like this, then there's somewhere in the culture a place where it's safe to talk that way. And right now, thankfully in America, it's not. There are people who'd like to make it that way. Um, and that's why you have panels like this, so people are aware, but I think we should put things in perspective. I think one of the reasons why this election was different than all other elections is that these people did not uh, operate in a one-way conversation. There was clearly right. some interplay between the campaign and these individuals. When you had, um, famously, um, Donald Trump uh, go on and not reflexively be able to denounce the Klan, or when you had uh, a visual image of piles of money, essentially, and a um, star on there, um, these were dog whistles, as we like to say, to the far right. And the question was whether there was an actual meeting of the minds, whether they were simply trying to encourage fringe followers, because when you're Donald Trump, you'll take any support you can get, or some combination of the rest. It is hard to believe in this day and age, with Jared Kushner as the son-in-law of now President of the United States, that this could have been inadvertent or ignorant at some level. Certainly, people could have or should have or did explain to them what was going on, and they chose to do it anyway. Um, again, whether that was intentional anti-Semitic um, <coughs> trying to gin up the audience or whether they knew they had followers from that um, segment of the population is um, up for debate. We've never had a president, at least in the last hundred years or so, um, who has engaged in this way, even you know, sort of um, mockingly perhaps, with um, a fringe group that is a white nationalist group. And that's, I think, when a lot of us, you know, antennas went up, and we began this debate with one another, with readers, um, with each other, about um, whether they simply used the Trump vehicle because they saw it was the closest thing to them, or whether the Trump campaign really was an outgrowth of the alt-right. And that debate continues to go on. I think it's important to put place the alt-right in, in its proper place in the broader context of the right-wing media. Um, because it, basically, I, I've written a lot about this and I've, I've followed this. Over the last 10 years or so, especially during the Obama era, there was a, the, the conservative media, right-wing media online, uh, and in other, other mediums, but especially online, uh, really kind of exploded. It became a lot bigger, it became a lot more professional, became a lot better funded. Um, <clears throat> and, and really, uh, along with these other forces in American politics, like the deregulation of political money and the fracturing and democratization of media in general, uh, th this kind of, uh, I call it the fringe establishment, uh, was kind of built up. And it was, it was composed of uh, you know, right-wing right pressure groups, uh, conservative media, talk radio, media personalities. Um, and it was really apart from the old guard Republican establishment, right? And, and I think one of the things Donald Trump realized very early on, uh, well before he launched his campaign, I think I, I, would, I would, if I had to pinpoint it, it would be around 2013, 2014. He, it, remember at this time, after to the 2012 election, Donald Trump had sort of been exiled by most mainstream figures in the Republican Party. Uh, he had spent the 2012 election talking about the birther conspiracy theory. Uh, and most serious Republicans, whether they were politicians, donors, uh, you know, kind of the conservative intelligentsia, had just about had enough with him and they were sick of him. Uh, but what Trump realized was that if he wanted conservative supporters or uh, attention from the right, he, he couldn't do it by courting the Wall Street Journal op-ed page or uh, you know, the, the, the head of the RNC. He had to go to places like Breitbart right? um, and, and similar websites and, and uh, talk radio personalities and internet provocateurs uh, and people like Alex Jones. Uh, conspiracy theory mongers. And he very deliberately and very meticulously and methodically courted that segment of the conservative media and the conservative establishment. And, and you know, before when, think, go back to early 2015, 
There was a lot of jockeying ahead of the 2016 Republican primaries. 16 candidates ended up running. Um, most people were not focused on that segment of the right, right? Most of the candidates were going through the motions of what a normal, normal Republican candidates did uh, to try to win their party's primary. Donald Trump knew that he didn't have a chance there and, and didn't even bother with the, the mainline establishment for the most part. He spent his time with that segment of the fringe establishment. Now, the, the, I wouldn't say that everyone in this network of websites uh, and, and media are necessarily part of the alt-right. Um, you know, people at The Blaze and uh, The Daily Caller and places like that are not all alt-right figures. Um, but, but what I think that the alt-right movement found is that they did have a home there, that they could at least be tolerated, even if they weren't agreed with by everyone there. Uh, Trump spent his time courting those people. He figured out how to dog whistle to them. He figured out how to uh, talk about things that would whip them up into a frenzy and, and uh, garner support. And, and that's what we saw throughout the primaries. And, and it was very effective from a cynical standpoint in a large field of 16 people, he was able to command a decent swath of the electorate, uh, the primary electorate, by doing that. And I think that the fear I have uh, as a political journalist looking forward is not just, it goes well beyond Donald Trump. It's how many other candidates are now going to say the path forward in a Republican primary is to court this segment of the primary electorate, this segment of the conservative media. I think that is a very frightening prospect. Let me just add to the point that McKay made. Um, the conservative media, all segments of it, played a very interesting role in all of this. Um, I would look at it at sort of three layers. One would be sort of the Breitbarts, the, the home base of the alt-right. The next level up would be rather extreme um, right-wing sites that have a pretense of being journalists um, but do not abide by the journalistic standards of even, you know, sort of the local newspapers. So those would be the Daily Caller, uh, The Blaze, Red State, um, some of these other websites. What happened was, as soon as Donald Trump made inroads with the bottom of the barrel, the next level up started getting intrigued because some of those people were their readers and their viewers and they started giving them attention. So he moved up a notch in the right-wing hierarchy, if you will. And then you came to the National Reviews, uh, American Conservative Union, and others. And they saw what was happening. Some of these people were their members. And so this kind of flowed upwards um, as each group became more concerned about losing their constituency to a Donald Trump-like movement. And that's how I think um, we can call it what it is, which is moral cowardice. We can say that it's um, reprehensible. But simply as an analytical matter, that's how they kind of moved up the food chain. And I also want to make a comment about the sort of top of the right-wing um, food chain that really did pave the way for Donald Trump. And they really don't like it when I say this, but I believe it to be true. And that is, there was a natural progression between an obsession with immigration and many groups that flogged the anti-immigrant uh, message, whether it be at um, Daily Caller, whether it be at National Review, um, supported by a lot of groups that were funded by some very strange individuals, FAIR, Numbers USA, have very crackpotish um, founding uh, uh, fathers, um, that they um, plowed the way so that when Donald Trump came along and talked about the wall or talked in more vivid terms, these people, their antenna didn't go up. They said, oh, yeah, he gets it. He's a little crude. He's a little rough. But this is the first guy who even gets what we're saying. And they didn't play the role of the gatekeeper. They played the role of the maitre d'. They welcomed him in. And um, I think they have yet to come to terms with that. And when we go back in history, I think there's going to be a reckoning about the degree to which a lot of the anti-right, anti, uh, I'm sorry, anti-left, anti-immigrant um, phenomenon paved the way for Donald Trump. Not intentionally, but they sure did make it a lot easier. If I could stay, stay on the president and um, to ask you get, to get us a little into the mind of an alt-right supporter, is there 
obviously we've, we, with our president, we face, we have someone who not only has a Jewish grandchild, but has been embraced by the prime minister in Israel and has really embraced policies that we traditionally interpret as pro-Israel in terms of deference to the democratically elected government of Israel. If you're an alt-right supporter, is there a degree of mental gymnastics involved in supporting this president for things that you like, or is this a totally separate consideration in terms of the president's policy on Israel and his Jewish family? So when I first started getting you know, attacked by these sorts of figures on uh, Twitter and social media, um, I used to ask them, because I was very curious, you, know, you are aware that his daughter converted to Orthodox Judaism, and the actual response I would get would be, nobody's perfect. <laughs> um, and I think this is actually, it's on one hand, it's actually kind of funny. And on the other hand, it actually showed something that actually disturbed me during the campaign and is more disturbing in retrospect, um, which is that the Nazis, so to speak, right, the neo-Nazis, the alt-right, are more pragmatic politically than some people on the far left in America who were unwilling to say vote for Hillary Clinton, right, or voted for Jill Stein or didn't show up, right? And whereas these neo-Nazis understood this is the best we've got. Right, it's the best we've ever had, and it's the best option on offer, and so we're gonna go in for that, and we're gonna go all in for that. And look who won. And this is the sort of thing that democratic publics need to think about when they're deciding who they're going to vote for. Um, and it's a, it reveals something a bit troubling, I think, sometimes about uh, voters and their preferences and what, they're willing to, what lengths they're willing to go for for candidates who aren't perfect. There's been a spike in anti-Semitic incidents over the last few months. Is there a link that could be drawn between the rise of the alt-right movement? Is this, they, 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 they certainly coincide in terms of the reports of the increased movement, the reports of incidents. Do, you, do any of you feel prepared enough to say that there's a real link there that can be tangibly de demonstrated? I think it's part of what we saw first in Europe and now what we see in the United States. I think when white nationalist groups of whatever type um, begin to percolate up and begin to get a foothold in the popular culture, um, the Jews are on the first line, on uh, the front line, and that has always been the case. I think what was so disturbing to many of us was that we thought, well, Europe is Europe. Um, Europe has always had this long and tortured history of um, anti-Semitism, but in America, it's a whole different ball of wax. And in fact, we are the least uh, anti-Semitic um, major country in the world. But it didn't stop um, in England. It didn't stop in Germany. And these events were been going on for years, of course, with very little notice, by the way, from American politicians. So put that in the back of your mind. Um, and then it took hold here. So I think it was both this general trend around the world and also you know, people take inspiration, if you will, from all sources. And as it soaks into the culture and as soon as, soon as behavior becomes uh, more acceptable, um, norms uh, collapse, barriers collapse. Um, and anecdotally, we heard stories of school kids you know, taunting one another in various ways. People listen and whether they um, in their own minds construe this as uh, anti-Semitic or whether they just think that this is an okay thing to do. I think that erosion of standards, the erosion of um, tolerance in American society did contribute to this and still does. You can go So <clears throat> I would like to wait until say the end of 2017 when we have like complete hate crime statistics to start to figure out are there trends, do they correlate with particular things? I know the ADL has started doing that and there's stuff that people can look up. Um, I think something that Jennifer said is worth uh, expanding on, which is that it's not so much that, say, we can prove one way or the other that did Trump, you know, his election or the alt-right contribute to a rise in anti-Semitism or other bigotries against minorities, uh, but it certainly has contributed to people starting to pay attention to the existence of these things. Um, and it's not because this, this, the anti-Semitism was always there. I was getting attacked by bigots on social media long before Donald Trump was a presidential candidate. People just weren't interested very much in the fact that this was happening. And it was sort of just a fringe phenomenon that people with very Jewish names who worked in the public sphere were just used to dealing with. And suddenly it became a national concern and people became interested in it. Um, and so now people are very interested in anti-Semitism and every little attack that happens in this slur in this high school and this thing in this neighborhood. And that's great. Um, I'm worried that when Donald Trump isn't on round on the scene for people to worry about, will they still care? Um, because this stuff long predates Donald Trump, it will post-date Donald Trump. Um, and if, if 
if we only care about particular bigotries, whether anti-Muslim or anti-Jewish, when it's politically expedient to do so, then do we really care? You know, a month or two months ago, we were talking mostly about the JCC threats that were occurring across the nation. And many, many groups, not AJC, but certainly many Jewish groups and many critics of the alt-right movement and critics of the president were very quick to put the blame there. And as it turns out, it does not appear to be the, uh, that the blame was there. Did they misstep? Did they mischaracterize how this was there? Were these incident, uh, incidents obviously weren't fabricated, but what's your take on the reaction of these groups when these things happen? I think it's naturally um, understandable that when Jews experience some sort of attack to assume that the anti-Semite on odds, you know, the odds are that it, the anti-Semite isn't Jewish, which isn't to say that there isn't such a thing as a Jewish anti-Semite. Uh, one of the fun facts of Jewish history is the largest mass burning of uh, Talmud in public burning in Jewish history was in, the, uh, in 1298 after a Jewish apostate to Christianity went to the Pope himself personally and denounced the Talmud as anti-Christian, which led to like 10 to 14,000 volumes of Talmud being burned in Paris. Uh, it's commemorated on Tisha B'Av in a prayer that's said. Um, and that was because of a Jew, right? So Jews excel at many things, including anti-Semitism. Um, and so the fact that this caller was also an Israeli Jew shouldn't be amazingly shocking, but you, Jewish organizations can be forgiven for assuming that that was not going to be the case. Pinning it on Trump, I think, was overstepping, and not everyone did that, um, but some people immediately assumed right, that this had to be because of Trump's election, and I, I, I understand people are discombobulated. They are thrown by this tremendous change of events around them, and they're worried by the rise of the old right. It's a natural thing to do, uh, but it's very dangerous, and when you don't have the facts of, like, of a hate crime, and this is whether it's against Jews or anybody else, it always pays to wait. And this is the, my journalist, my inner journalist speaking. Right? If you, it's, it's tempting to tweet it. You'll get 500 retweets for the speculation, and you'll look like an idiot tomorrow, and you'll then decrease sensitivity to the real thing when it happens later. So it's always worth to like, you know, take a step back. And, you know, and, and so I think that there is a lesson to be learned from that. I think one of the reasons that people became convinced that somehow Donald Trump was behind this was that he, for a very long time, referred uh, and refused to directly condemn anti-Semitic attacks. Um, of course, it's always about Donald. So you know, when he was finally pushed in a, uh, in, in a uh, press conference, he said, I'm the least anti-Semitic person there is. <laughs> Donald, it's not about you. Um, but it always <laughs> is. And I think we have. Um, very nicely gotten used to having presidents who are very quick to condemn whatever their political background, whether you're talking about George Bush, you're talking about Barack Obama, you're talking about Jimmy Carter, wh whoever, that are very firm and very clear in denouncing religious or uh, racial hate crimes. I mean, this, this is sort of like a first principle of American politics. And this is what I talk about um, with the erosion of democratic norms. Um, there's nothing illegal, there's no institution um, that is set up to prevent that, but there has been a general understanding of civilized people that that is what the president does. He has a role in condemning uh, discrimination. There's no equivocation, there's no explaining it. So when this guy comes along and he shuffles about and he doesn't want to say something and he um, attacks, you know, verbally attacks, you know, a Jewish reporter who's asking a question, people start thinking this is weird. So it's not entirely um, a figment of their imagination that Donald Trump might have been encouraging this or in some way being behind this. Um, he likes to say he's a different kind of president. Well, if you're going to be a different kind of president, people are going to think different things about you. Um, and I don't, I have no idea whether the administration learned a lesson from this or cares to learn a lesson or think this ultimately wasn't better for him. Um, but that's in large part, I think, why um, sort of suspicion and um, concern focused on the president, because he didn't do the presidential thing. McKay, you see, I think you were starting to say something. No, that. yeah, no, I, I was just going to say, to your point, I, I think that one of the things that's important to understand, especially for those who are, have or are, or are likely to come under attack at some point by alt-right people on social media, online, whatever, um, or in real life, is that um, what they want, one of the things they want is hysteria. They want to create hysteria. They want to create fear. They want to draw uh, very strong reactions from the people they're targeting. Now, I'm not going to sit here and say, don't be scared and don't, you know, be, don't, don't react when people start, you know, 
hurling anti-Semitic attacks at you. I mean, that's a natural thing. I, I, I just think that it's worth remembering that the majority of these people, especially the kind of people who are anonymous and hiding behind avatars and aren't willing to put their names and their faces to, to these attacks, really what gives them the most satisfaction is people who in their minds are overreacting to their attacks, right? Because they, they see themselves as, uh, as I mean, th this is, you know, I'm gonna go deep into the psyche of these people, but they see themselves as somehow more elevated uh, or, or even enlightened when they're able to emotionally manipulate uh, the people that they're targeting. So when they're hurling anti-Semitic attacks, when they're, uh, when they're um, <coughs> photoshopping people into gas chambers, when they're doing these kind of outlandish, preposterously provocative, horrible things, what they want is to get a rise out of you. Um, and the more that you give that to them, the more that they're, they're motivated to keep going. And so I, I, I've, I've found, in, you know, I, I'm in a different situation, but when I've come under attack by these kind of armies of alt-right trolls, I, I found that it's mostly easy to, it, the, the best course of action, if it's possible, is to remember that these are mostly pretty pathetic people who are in their basements, in their parents' basements, a lot of them are teenagers. A lot of them are probably virgins. Uh, they, they, they frankly just, this is their social life. This is the only thing going on in their lives that they get any kind of joy from. And that's sad and pathetic and tragic. And so just to remember that these people are, are ultimately very depressing figures on the fringes of America. You know, if you're in a position to ignore them, uh, that that mindset, I think, can help you to move on. Well, there is a time when Donald Trump is right, you know, a broken clock is right twice a day, and he would call these people losers. Evil losers, right? Evil yes. losers, there <laughs> right. you go. Yeah. Um, so one way you can respond to this sort of thing on social media is basically, you know, just to ignore because they thrive on attention, and what you're doing is what they say, feeding the trolls, and that just makes them stronger. Um, Something that I'm actually going to be talking about in the panel tomorrow, which I didn't want to sort of step on, but I think is valuable in this context, is these people are trying to get people, Jews, angry. They're trying to get minorities angry. They're trying to provoke hysteria. Um, and when you don't respond in kind and you just sort of mock them or turn a dynamic around on them, they don't know what to do, and they often just go away. Um, and so I will, with some regularity, get tweeted some variant of the slur, right? You Jews, you control, you know, 90% of the media, and they usually have a figure, right? And the, now the Goyim are catching on, right? And they're like, you know, just admit it. And then I will quote that tweet and respond and say, this is absolutely preposterous. At the last meeting, we confirmed that we control 96% of the media. <laughs> and so if they actually believe it, I've just deepened their paranoid delusion. So that's a win. And if they didn't and they were just doing it to try to mess with me, well, I've just messed with them right back. And then I have significantly more of a following than they do, so what ends up happening is that that gets shared a lot of times. People laugh at them. They start trolling them in addition. And then very often the anti semite will then delete the tweet because they don't want to deal with the same thing they were trying to do to me. And so, and I'll be talking about this with uh, Rabia Chowdhury, um, who's a really remarkable woman who is part of AJC's Muslim Advisory Council, and she deals with this as a Muslim woman all the time as well. And we'll be talking about different techniques you can do. Sometimes it means to ignore. Sometimes you have to report certain things because they are very serious. And sometimes it means you know, refusing to take the bait and just turning it around and recognizing that the majority of people in any social media space are actually not crazy and not bigots. And if you just show them what's going on and you mock it, they'll laugh along with you. And these people will realize we're not, they're not welcome here. And that's a valuable thing. So, so I have one or two more questions. Then we'll turn to the audience. So please be ready. And we'll have staff walking around. Uh, with microphones, but if I could keep you in within the psyche or within the, the basement, the parents' basement <laughs> of the alt right, uh, is there is there a hierarchy of hate? Like, where do we rank as Jews versus versus Muslims <laughs> versus Latinos, African Americans? You could throw in Mormons, McKay, if you're yeah. interested on that. But uh, I, not that I want to keep score, but maybe I do a little bit. <laughs> uh, that's a that's a good question. I, you guys can correct me if I'm wrong. I, I would say that. Um, that the most, it, it often, often it depends on what's happening in the news or in the world. Um, I will say in the wake of the London terror attacks, uh, Muslims probably rank at the, the top of the, the list. Um, but you know, these things change, right? It, it, they're, these are very reactive uh, people and, and they, they're responding to 
uh, whatever kind of story is bouncing around in their kind of strange corner of the internet. Um, and, and that will often shape how they, how they uh, look, at, look at you. I, I, I myself am Mormon, and I have been uh, frequently attacked by these people uh, for being Mormon. Um, they, I, I've learned a lot of uh, new alt-right conspiracy theories over the last year about uh, Mormons and Jews conspiring uh, to, to That's take That's in the, the next world. room, just yeah, so you so, know. Yeah. We will be on a panel together um, discussing Invitation the strategy. Only. Yeah. No, but, um, but I, I would say that generally speaking, they, are, they, they direct their hate at people who they feel threatened by in some way. And, so, and, and sometimes that's a genuine uh, fear of what, you know, terrorist attacks or whatever uh, that, that's, that they then project onto all believing Muslims, for example. Sometimes it's, they, they, it can be a small, I've talked to people in the alt-right who are, it, when, when you really drill down, they, you know, have their girlfriend stolen by someone who's Jewish. And that's where their, <laughs> their, their hate comes from. You know, like, this can be very personal or it can be global. Uh, but ultimately, it, it comes down to fear and paranoia and, and who they feel threatened by. And, 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 I, you know, and I think that the hierarchy can shift depending on who you're talking to and what's going on. I will say that immigration plays a massive role in these people's thinking. Um, yeah. And this is, in part, um, I think, the responsibility of some of those conservatives higher up the food chain. Um, they believe that um, millions of people are still flooding across the border. Facts be damned. They believe that we've had a surge in crime in Chicago because of illegal immigrants. They, um, immigration is the whipping boy, whether it's an economic issue, whether it's a foreign policy issue. The response to terrorism is a travel ban, get rid of the foreigners. The response to economic dislocation is build the wall. So it is this obsession, it is this xenophobia, and because, um, of course, foreigners can mean anyone, um, the locus may shift around, um, but the absolute obsession with immigration, I think, is a telling um, issue for them, and it's a telling connection between them and um, right-wing uh, journalists higher up the food chain. So my final question, and uh, I, there's too many of you to walk around with mics, so we'll, we'll ask you to stand up and just speak very loudly when we do those questions. But obviously, this movement does include a lot of losers, uh, no question. But in, in your opinion, and in, in any of you, was it big enough, was it powerful enough to play a significant role in this last election? I mean, to put a very fine point on it, is Donald Trump in the White House right now because of the alt-right? Well, um, I've made this argument um, about Hillary Clinton's um, version of the election. Um, th when an election is this close, and we're talking about 78,000 people in three states, everything is a but for cause of Donald Trump. But for James Comey coming out you know, 11 days before the end of the election. But for Hillary Clinton not going to these places. But for the alt rate getting engaged, maybe voting for the first time. You know, you can go on and on and on. And I think the lesson is in close elections, and even in non-close elections, these things matter a lot. And um, to all those people who sat on their couches because they didn't think uh, it mattered or they didn't think um, Donald Trump was ever going to be elected, um, they should take a look at the alt-right because those people did get out um, enthusiastically. So in a very perverse way, I think it's um, an advertisement for re-engagement um, in uh, grassroots democracy for the rest of us. Thank you. OK, questions from the audience. Um, Jerry, I'll go first. <laughs> um, you've spoken a lot about the alt-right's views, if you will, of uh, domestic areas. Um, other than the fact that they obviously <coughs> view the United States as a, a nation state and not a player in the international community and, and aren't too keen on foreigners, is there any consistency to the foreign policy positions of the alt-right? Well, of course, they're very fond of Vladimir Putin. Oh, the, the question was, um, with regard to foreign policy, does the alt-right the alt have a view or a position? Um, and the answer is, um, from what I can discern, their main foreign policy position is pro-Putin. 
Um, and why is that? Um, well, for one thing, Donald Trump is being attacked by liberals for being close to Putin, so that means they have to defend Putin. This is how the you know, chain goes. Um, for another thing, in this kind of bizarre thinking, although they don't really understand that it's a different branch of Christianity, they see um, the Russian state, the, res the restoration of the, uh, they don't know it, but the Eastern um, Orthodox uh, Church um, as um, a model for them. This is the return of Russia of um, blood and soil. This is a return um, that's going to sweep away the elites, sweep away the cities, the cosmopolitan people. You go back to, to Mother Earth and to religion. So that's another reason, I think, while well, they're very game on this. And third of all, they love how he governs. Yes. He represses gays. He shuts up um, you know, uh, human rights activists. Um, he lies with impunity. This is their you know, hero. This is their model. So I think for all of those reasons, and probably some more, um, they're beginning to see everything through the lens of Russia, which is just bizarre for a president <laughs> who, of course, advertised himself as America first. Um, so now we have sort of a, a Russia first group that's out there. I, I agree. I think another reason for the obsession with, with Putin um, is that there is an obsession in the alt-right with the, the concept of masculinity. Mm. Uh, it, we should. We haven't touched on this yet, but this is one of like the pillars of alt right thinking. Is that the, that uh, that the vast majority of, of uh, American men, especially liberal American men, uh, are are what do they call? I mean, they call them cucks. They call them beta males. Um, that that there's a crisis of testosterone in America, essentially, <laughs> and that. Uh, that the alt right and Trump's alt right supporters are represent the resurgence and return of of true uh, alpha male testosterone masculinity, and that that's a very that's a, an extremely important part of making America great again. So when they look at Putin and, and other strongmen leaders throughout the the world, that the kind of people that Trump often praises, they see they see people who are who are uh, governing with an iron fist, and that, that that's actually a good thing, that that's something to be emulated uh, here in America by Donald Trump. So I, I think that that's also part of the, I mean, the, the, to the extent that there is any kind of coherent foreign policy on the right, or in the alt-right, I don't know if there is, but certainly strongman tactics uh, are an important part of it. And I would also add that, yes, isolationism is, uh, is kind of one of the core tenets as well. Makes one uh, reminisce longingly about when the right wing hated Russia somewhere. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yes, go ahead. Please stand up and say your name. Yep. It's hmm. a great, a great point. She asked, uh, "Can you talk about the way that uh, the alt right uses and abuses the concept of free speech?" Uh, this is one of the other things you'll hear all the time uh, from the alt right, a and including the very successful alt right media personalities, people like uh, Milo Yiannopoulos, uh, Breitbart, and other other people, is that they'll say that at the at the core of their ideology is a radical defense of free speech that the reason that they push boundaries, the reason they say uh, racist and anti-Semitic uh, things is to kind of shake awake Americans who are uh, becoming, uh, becoming, you know. Politically correct. Yeah, too politically correct, watering down their speech, becoming uh, kind of too, they're, they're, not, they're, they're, they're not protecting the concept of being able to say whatever you want uh, when you, whenever you want, which, I would add, has never actually been what free speech in America necessarily meant. But, the, but often, when you push back against somebody who is saying these outlandish things uh, on the alt-right, they'll say, this is a classic move uh, by, by liberal America, by the left. You're, try you're the real fascists because you're trying to get rid of free speech in America by censoring us. Um, I mean, I think that that's self-evidently a preposterous argument, but that is what they, that is their that, that is what they say. You wanted to add something? Oh. No, I think that's okay. Um, here, let's actually take three. So go ahead, and um, if I can ask everyone just to try to remember them, I'll try to take notes as well. Okay. So um, from your perspective, how do you think the message that the alt-right groups are spreading and that are 
are being conveyed in the media are affecting the youth of today and will affect how they speak and how they treat others, I guess. Great. I can get two more. Uh, Steve? We've heard you talk about the trolls. Are there leaders that you see putting together a real movement that makes them powerful in the future? Okay. And uh, Senator? Why do so many Republicans not admit before the election that they were going to vote for Trump? <laughs> as a state chairman, an elected Republican, I was a state chairman of the Johnson Wells Lake because we thought we had about five or six states which we could possibly, could possibly push this to the Congress. We were absolutely wrong. The people lied, Republicans lied, about how they were going to vote if they really knew it. And we suspect that they did. We have a reason why, they, why Republicans wouldn't admit that before the primary. So we got kids, trolls, and Republicans. I'll let you uh... <laughs> I'll take the kids. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, we have this duality. On one hand, um, for all the abuse the millennials take, um, it is by far the most tolerant generation in American history in terms of race, in terms of gender. Um, you know, it, um, I think in some respects it um, stuns them that um, we are um, much more race conscious than they are. So you start from that premise. So how can that group of people um, coexist with this other group of people that might be sort of the down and outers, the people who feel like um, they're not where they should be because um, of some elite conspiracy? And the answer is there's no one answer in America. It's a very diverse place. And I think you can say overwhelmingly that this next generation, the millennial generation, is very tolerant, is much more sophisticated than their parents, um, has access to much more media. Sometimes that's good, sometimes that's bad. Um, in a lot of ways, is much more worldly, in a, in a good sense of the word. Um, but at the same time, um, we see this divide in American society that does go down age brackets, um, which is in rural communities, in um, sort of the uh, Rust Belt states, that there are, there's a heroin e epidemic, there's economic displacement. Those kids living in the basement are living in the basement because they can't get a job. Um, so I don't want to justify or minimize that, but I think um, they do have a breeding ground at the same time that millennials have the capacity, I think, to inoculate themselves and hopefully the country. Um, against these people. So it's all on you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Who, do you want to take trolls or Republicans? <laughs> I actually was going to talk about uh, some of this stuff uh, affecting youth and infiltrating the real world because a lot of it stays on the internet, so to speak. A lot of it is never going to come out in real life. Um, but there are troubling instances where some of this stuff seeps into the real world, into those populations, right, who are the ex you know, perhaps the exceptions or the, the cast-offs, right, who exist in this, say, you know, anti-liberal or pro-Trump universe, and they've seen these sorts of memes and catchphrases and ways of talking about Jews and others, and they start to repeat them in real life. And so there is this uh, conservative journalist um, named Ben Shapiro who broke with Breitbart over its Trump boosterism, and he went to speak at a particular university, and he was confronted with an, a pro-Trump protester Right, he's typically confronted with left-wing protesters, but in this case, it was a pro-Trump protester. And when they like had some conversation, and Shapiro said something about like you know bad things about the alt right, uh, the guy responded to him just saying, "Ayve, it's another Shoah." Now, if you know this phrase, if you look online, or if you Google it, this is a catchphrase that is used to try to get a rise out of Jews. Whenever a Jew complains about anti-Semitism or anything else that they don't like in the world, or anything politically that the alt-right disagrees with, they don't respond to it substantively. They write back and say, oh, it's another Holocaust, right? But they purposely use the word Shoah, and it's done in a mocking way. And so, but here was somebody confronting with it, and how did that kid learn that phrase? How did he even know that Holocaust is, is Shoah in Hebrew, right? The typical American kid, right, at a middle American university. So these people are seeing this stuff pop up on Reddit and in their social media universes, so those who get ensnared in it, they will start to say these things out loud. And I think people should be aware. There are, you know, occasionally, you know, signs snapped of, you know, pro-Trump rallies where, like, signs are held up that say, like, the guy no, right? These are, like, catchphrases all the right. They're actually kind of funny, to be honest. I find them amusing, and they're sad. Um, but they just sort of slowly seep in, and so we should be vigilant. 
you should make sure to show these people, you know, and make people realize that the old right isn't cool. It isn't hip. It isn't, you know, how you're going to be edgy. It's basically just a bunch of losers. And if you make that clear to people, no one wants to be a part of that, and no one wants to sound like that. And then they'll stop talking like that. Um, I'll, I'll answer the question about Republicans uh, not admitting to pollsters that they plan to vote for Trump. I think it has a lot to do with what we've been talking about today. Uh, one of the main reasons is that there, were, there was a segment of the Republican uh, electorate that knew Trump was associated with stuff like this, whether you know, deliberately or not, in their social, social circles, in their conversations uh, with, with friends, um, in the media that they consumed, these tended to be, I think, the, the ones who were the last ones to kind of board the Trump train were probably more affu affluent, more educated, uh, kind of Romney voting Republicans. Uh, and I think that a lot of them felt embarrassed to uh, talk about their plan to vote for Trump or talk about even entertaining voting for Trump because they felt like it would brand them as racist or anti-Semitic or uh, whatever. Look, uh, I, you know, you can, I, I, I don't think, and, and I think this is an important point, I don't think the vast majority of Trump supporters are, would identify as part of the alt-right. I think it's probably true that a lot, a large number of Trump supporters don't even know what the alt-right is. Um, but, but you can't separate it from uh, what the Trump campaign did throughout the 2016 election cycle. Uh, and I think that there, um, there were a number of Republicans who were on the fence, who didn't know if they could bring themselves to pull the lever for Trump. Uh, but at the end of the day, they, they told themselves, look, I'm not racist, I'm not misogynistic, I'm not, I'm not uh, anti-Semitic, uh, but at the end of the day, I hate Hillary Clinton so much, or I uh, think it's so important that we have a Republican Supreme Court nominee, or whatever other justification, that I'm willing to tolerate some of that and vote for Trump. Um, and I think that that's what we saw in 2016. And uh, I think that you now see a conversation going on on the left in the Democratic Party about if it's even possible to win over those kind of affluent professional uh, Romney voters, um, or if Donald Trump's election showed that they're basically unpersuadable. I think we could be seeing the beginning of a broad partisan realignment that may take a generation. Um, where a certain portion of traditional Democratic voters just uh, shift permanently into the Republican base and a certain portion of Republican voters shift into the Democratic base. I think it'll take a generation. I think it'll depend on whether the Republican Party retreats from Trumpism or embraces it. It'll depend a lot on whether Democrats <coughs> embrace Bernie Sanders style uh, platform or if they go back to kind of more of a center left Clinton style platform. But it is possible that we're seeing a, a realignment that could define American politics for generations to come. Absolutely. And, um, Never did I think we'd all be so fascinated in the Georgia 6th congressional district. But one of the reasons we are is for exactly the reason that McKay said. Are you from Georgia? Are you from that district? Yeah. All right, there you go. All right, so millions and millions of dollars have flowed in there. Uh, I'm sure you're peppered with ads all day long till you're sick of it. Um, you have um, a rather affluent um, district in sort of the suburbs of Atlanta, part of Atlanta and into the suburbs. Um, and um, this is an opportunity to sort of test that theory. Um, this was a district that voted um, by a 23% margin for their congressman, who later became our head of HHS, uh, Tom Price. 23 points. Donald Trump barely carried the district by a point. So here you had a large contingent of Republican voters who felt comfortable voting for Tom Price, but couldn't bring themselves to vote for Hillary Clinton. And we've had so much discussion about the white working class and how the Democrats are going to appeal to it. The other half of this coin is they have a wonderful opportunity to sway back um, better educated, um, you know, some uh, you know, sort of suburban um, white voters who look at Donald Trump and say, not me, thanks, um, or who just see you know, sort of what a disaster, or they feel their intelligence is being insulted, or, or many other things. So you have this really interesting divide that's really, in essence, by education and by class. We haven't had that in America. Um, that's a very kind of European thing, mm -hmm. um, and it has a lot of problems with it. But I think 
we are seeing it because it is dividing um, in that way. Let's try to do three more real quickly. Um, one. Over there. Go ahead. Um, Joel Negrin from Westchester, short. What is the deep state and how does it relate to this <laughs> structure? Is there one over there? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, and a third one over there. Great. Okay, so those are our three for now. Let me take the last one first because it's an issue that um, as someone who considers herself or at one point considers herself sort of center right, um, that is very much, that is very, um, you know, much in play. Um, I think um, to begin with, it's a misnomer um, and sort of an anti-Semitic thing actually that Jews so, number sorry, one. Uh, there's some requests that just we repeat the question. Oh, so I'm the, sorry. The question I'm sorry. was, I, uh, I'm happy to do is, is reconciling the Trump administration's support for Israel and the links to the alt-right and other troubling domestic policies right. or policies that might trouble people right. on the domestic side. It's actually a misnomer and sort of a slur from um, anti-Semitic quarters that all Jews care about is Israel, that that's the first issue they care about. Um, it's never been the case. It's not the case now. Um, and uh, many supporters of Israel wish they would care more about Israel. Um, but like any voters, um, Jews are no different. They vote for multiple reasons um, based upon multiple values and interests, um, and it's a little bit more complicated. Um, in fact, when you look at jo Jewish voting patterns, they are much more moved um, by social justice issues than really anything else. Um, and that does come from a religious background, that does come from um, the widespread understanding of tikkun olam, that does um, come from a um, universalist aspect. Um, again, our critics, our enemies would accuse us of always being only concerned about other Jews. In fact, the opposite is the case. So I think what we saw with Donald Trump is, um, you know, he got very, very little of the Jewish vote for exactly that reason. Um, first of all, they didn't perceive Hillary Clinton as identical to Barack Obama, so to the extent that they didn't like Barack Obama's policies towards Israel, they thought Hillary would be better. You can evaluate that either way. And secondly, they essentially said, you know, it's not worth it. Um, and I've made this argument to my conservative friends about the Supreme Court. You know, it ain't worth it. Um, you may have, you know, this is the broken clock is right twice a day. Um, it's not worth um, the rest of the day to be assaulted. And you're not going to have a strong Israel-US relationship without a strong US. The basis for our connection for Israel is shared values, shared democratic traditions. And if we're going to behave like thugs and we're going to lose our moral standing, we'll be of very little help to Israel. Um, and we will, um, those binds, those, those ties will unwind themselves. So I think um, American Jews, um, in my view, correctly, in other people's view, not correctly, prioritized. Um, and they made that decision. Um, and I think um, this is probably giving our Republican uh, Jewish coalition friends fits. Um, but there are many people who said, if he's the president, I'm not supporting you guys um, for all of these reasons. So that's, I think, the conversation that's kind of going on throughout the pro-Israel community and with the Jewish community. I'd like to use that question as an opportunity to answer a related question that I thought we'd be asked, but we weren't, which is, uh, what is the alt-right uh, relationship to Zionism? Um, and this is something that's come up 
uh, sporadically since, you know, throughout the campaign and since Trump's election. The alt-right has this sort of trolling tactic where they pretend to like Israel and Zionism and just say, we want to be Zionists for America for white people, right? Zionism for white people is what they say. Um, now, what's really going on, and this gets taken at face value by people who don't understand the alt-right and that they purposely troll by adopting the values and the things held dearly by the people they're trying to mess with and then turning them on those people, like free speech. Right? These are, it's not actually a deeply held value of their own. They're using their values against you. Um, but it's also taken at face value by people on the far left who want to associate Zionism with the alt-right. So this is very convenient. They can say, well, look, you know, they're, they're the alt-right. This is the clock right, you know, right twice a day. They're right. Zionism is really just white nationalism. Um, it's absolute nonsense. Um, and I, I can explain it by the way of an analogy, which is something that the white nationalists and the alt-right also like to talk about is they'll point to like, falling, you know, say, graduation rates uh, for whites from college. And they'll say, well, obviously, we need affirmative action for white people. This is another thing they say. Um, they, wa they once uh, tweeted at a friend of mine who was a colleague of McKay's, Adam Sewer, who's an African-American Jew, and they said, we, j we need a an NWACP, thinking like that would be an NWACP for white people, but like the CP is the colored people at the end, so an NWACP. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, why can't we have one of those yeah. national white people advancing colored people? It sounds good to me. <laughs> um, so, but the idea there is, again, why can't we have affirmative action for white people? Now, if you ask then this alt-right person, oh, so you're saying affirmative action, it's a good thing, and that's some point in history, if not now, it was a good idea for African Americans, you just also want it for white people. And they're like, no, I hate black people and I hate affirmative action. They're just using this concept of affirmative action to mess with people who actually believe in it by saying, well, then you should apply it to us. And the same thing is going on with Zionism, where, and what's going on? Why do we have affirmative action for African Americans? Because there's a historical legacy of oppression of a minority, and it was remedied through this particular mechanism. White people don't have that, therefore there isn't the need for affirmative action. Why is Israel there? Because there's this historical situation where Jews were oppressed and persecuted and murdered. And so we created a Jewish state right in their historic homeland as a solution to this problem. And when you take the idea out of the historical context, right, you can then troll people and say, we just want it for a majority culture that actually doesn't need it, doesn't have that historical history of oppression. And this was never designed as a solution for them. Um, and basically appropriating the means of... Uh, protecting people from their oppressors for their oppressors. And that's the whole entire dynamic. It's being done with affirmative action. It's being done with Zionism. And so whether you hear it from an old right person or you hear it from someone on the far left who finds this a convenient club to hit Israel with, it's not true. And people should be aware of that. There's a question about Bannon, I yeah, think. And the deep and state. And the deep state. The two poles of the Trump administration. Um, I'll, I'll take Bannon first. Uh, yeah, so, the, so Bannon, Steve Bannon, former chairman of, of Breitbart, um, famously referred to Breitbart as the, a platform, the, the platform for the alt-right, I believe is what he said. Uh, certainly had no qualms about the alt-right. In fact, welcomed, it, uh, welcomed their members, welcomed that belief system, that whole attitude into Breitbart, and really helped to transform Breitbart as a website into uh, a, a probably one of the most powerful forces online uh, for alt-rightism. Um, he's now a senior advisor to the president. Uh, he's in the White House. I, I, I do think that um, we've, we've spoken a lot. I think I've used the word fringe several times today. We've talked a lot about the alt-right as a fringe movement. And I do think in terms of numbers, in terms of uh, their, their actual size, it is still a fringe movement. They, I just don't believe that, uh, I mean, I, I don't have polling to back this up, but I don't believe that uh, any serious portion of the American electorate um, would agree with most of what the alt-right says. That said, a one of, Steve Bannon, one of the, the I think you could say alt-right leaders, or at least one of the leading alt-right enablers in America, is one of the most powerful people in the government right now. So, you know, the, these things, fringe movements become mainstream not always by... Um, converting millions of people en masse all at once. Often what needs to happen first is that uh, members of that fringe movement f maneuver into powerful positions and then use their positions of power uh, to advance that agenda. Now, uh, you know, 
you talk to Steve Bannon, he will not say that his agenda is an alt-right agenda. He'll say he's a nationalist. And he, and he takes uh, issue with people saying he's a white nationalist. He says he's just a nationalist in general, an economic nationalist. Um, and, and a lot of the debates that we're going to have in American politics over the next several years and maybe longer are going to be about nationalism versus globalism. I think that's inevitable. But, um, but it still matters, I think, that Steve Bannon has such an important position in this White House because it, it, it at least clears the path. It makes it, it, makes it legitimate. It, makes it, uh, it, it adds a, a, a veneer of respectability to uh, the, the, the group, that this kind of far-right fringe group that, he's, uh, that he, in a past life, championed. So I, I think that that does matter. Uh, to answer the deep state question, unless one of you wants to take that. The deep state is- We're uh, part of it, we can't talk yeah, about we, it. <laughs> oh, sorry, yes. Um, Stays in the deep state. <laughs> well, yeah. No, the, uh, the deep state is a term that um, Trump supporters will use to kind of refer to government bureaucrats, the intelligence community, uh, basically people deep in the government who they say are out to destroy the Trump presidency. Um, that they, they, they point to the leaks from the intelligence community, leaks from the FBI, from the CIA, um, every you know damaging mainstream media story that comes out about the Russia investigation. All of this is part of a deep state conspiracy to take Donald Trump down. Um, th this line of argument is not historic. Is not a historic anomaly. Uh, if you look throughout history, uh, leaders like Donald Trump will often. Uh, try to pit his populist movement and his followers against uh, the deep state or, or whatever else, you, the, the government class. Um, but, you know, look, I, I do think that there's a legitimate argument to be had, debate to be had about what role the intelligence community should play in, uh, in partisan politics. And clearly there are people in the intelligence community who are motivated by a desire to, uh, to torpedo Donald Trump. And, uh, and, you know, but, but there are also a lot of people acting in, in good faith who believe there is troubling information out there that needs to come out. I think to dismiss it all as a deep state conspiracy is preposterous. But. You know, it's very interesting. Here's a case in which um, Steve Bannon sort of gave away his hand. He talks about an attack on the administrative state. So he's probably referring to this whole thing. That's an attack on democratic institutions. The courts are part of the deep state. Well, gosh, yeah, they are. They are an integral part of our democracy. Um, civil servants who insist upon putting out truthful information as opposed to putting out nonsense information on their agency's website, they're part of the deep state. That's right, these people have taken an oath um, and are working for the United States of America and not for Donald Trump. Well, look at all these you know, conservatives in Congress who are slowing up uh, you know, the train. First of all, there aren't that many slowing up the train. <laughs> um, and secondly, again, um, there are people, there are institutions that are specifically designed to protect democracy when a strong man, when a demagogue comes along. So it should delight us, it shouldn't surprise us that those things sort of pop up um, when someone comes in to threaten not a policy position, but the institution itself. If someone's gonna call, um, if someone's gonna refer to the courts as so-called judges, um, we have a problem. Um, so I think um, one of the fears that I had, which I am very happy to say I think I was wrong about, was that um, many of these institutions would collapse under Donald Trump, and they haven't. And C. Bannon may hate it and call it the deep state, and I would call it democratic institutions reasserting themselves when we're provided with a, a lethal threat. I just want to note that Jen has had two applause lines today, and yet you have at zero. Um, <laughs> just keeping score. Thank you. I appreciate right. that. That was fishing for applause. I'm going to give you half credit on that applause. <laughs> okay, yeah, line, I'll so. take half a point. Okay, unfortunately we are close to out of time, so I'm gonna ask one final question with apologies to all the hands and, and ask you just to do a speed round. But if, we were, if I were to ask you to look into your crystal ball and this was Global Forum 2021, will we still be talking about the alt-right? Yes, I think we will still be talking about a group of disaffected supranationalists. 
my hope would be they will be furious having lost the presidency <laughs> and seeing a resurgence of either a normal Republican or a normal Democrat. Um, but I think the people themselves are not going to go away. Yeah, yeah. I think if I learned anything from this election, it's not to make any predictions about this sort of thing. Uh, so I have no idea, and I'm just going to say that. I, I also don't have any idea, but I'll give the pessimistic take, which is the, I think the fear, the concern is that we won't be talking about the alt-right because so much of their thinking has been embedded in a political party, and it's just something that is part of the mainstream political conversation. I hope that's not the case. But you know, I'm not advocating for that, certainly. But I, I think it is a distinct possibility that we need to be aware of. And on that note. <laughs> so please join me in thanking. Yeah.